1986. It is September 2, 1986, and for the Oral History Project of Historic Madison, I, Lorraine Orchard, am talking with Miss Louise Marston in her apartment at the Kennedy Manor, 1 Langdon Street in Madison. Miss Marston was previously interviewed for this same project by Bud Ponick, who talked with her about her own life. Today, we're going to focus on her observations of the community of Madison and the changes it has undergone since she arrived here as a student and then continued to work in Madison as the society editor of the Wisconsin State Journal. This she did after her graduation from the University of Wisconsin. Louise, as I drove down Langdon Street, I couldn't help th thinking back to my college days, and certainly to yours too, about the change in dress, architecture, behavior, and everything of these beloved students. And I know you're as happy as I am to see them back, but what in general do you notice? Oh, the changes are unbelievable, Lorraine. Um, when I was in the University of Wisconsin, I believe that there were eight or 9,000 students. I was here from 1929 to 1931, and uh, it was depression. Nobody had any money at all. But I want to tell you something. Depression or not, we dressed so much better in those days in better, more appropriate taste than they do now that I can't get over it. And I realize I'm 76 years old and an old fuddy-dud, but I never cease to be shocked over the way I see the students on Langdon Street, Park Street, and on the campus uh, to me, it is unbelievable. I always laugh and say my mother would never have let me out of the house in, in about 98% of the outfits that I see day after day uh, on Langdon Street. I've lived in the heart of the student section uh, all, all my life in Madison. Do you think that uh, behavior, too, has changed or customs on the campus? Oh, mercy, have we got all night? I should, <laughs> I should say they have changed. Uh, they, they've changed a great deal. And I think, tragically, for today's, what is it, 45,000 students we have yeah, here? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I think it's just tragic. For instance, look, no more junior prom, no more military ball. No more big dances at, on weekends at the Memorial Union. These all-campus things that used to draw 1,200, 1,500 people uh, and were such a gala event for the undergraduates. I, I think that today's young people are missing out on so much of the color of student life. You're only young once. And why not have some fun? Now let's see. Let's see. Uh, do you notice a similar change in the downtown area and just Madison in general in dress and costumes? Oh yes, I I think that that. Uh, nearly everybody, especially in my age group, Lorraine, is just horrified uh, when they go on the square or go around to the malls and see the informality of dress that has taken place in Madison uh, over the years. Now, everybody tells me that this is nationwide, and I'm sure that it probably is. I can only be annoyed over what I see in Madison, the city that I love so much. For example, when I see obese men and women who shouldn't be caught dead uh, in such attire parading around the square and in the malls, 
in all too brief uh, um, shorts and unbelievable t-shirts and uh, what not um, I, I just can't get over it somehow or other human pride seems to have vanished and um, this this uh, all too casual informality uh, just simply horrifies me I would like to to um, carry on if you if you don't Go object ahead. at sure. this point to my very strong personal feelings and observations about dress in Madison over what is it I came here on my job as society editor on January 9th 1934 um, and uh, 52 years ago and I want to tell you something flat-footedly and this this may upset you, but it happens to be my personal opinion. I think Madison has lost so much of its class. Madison people, I don't know what caused it. It's a terrible thing in my book. Uh, had no longer distinguish an occasion with a capital O and an occasion with a little O. They dress exactly the same for a um, tremendously important social occasion as they do for more informal things. I want to tell you uh, something that I still cannot get over. Uh, there was a very beautiful formal evening wedding in Madison this summer of very prominent Madisonians. I didn't happen to be invited. At 76, you don't get invited every other Tuesday to a <laughs> wedding, you know. But um, a lot of my very close friends were invited to this wedding. And they reported to me what they saw, and I could not believe it. For instance, they saw one young woman in tennis shoes at a formal evening wedding. Another woman, young woman, was in very sporty slacks and a flowered blouse. She looked as though she might be going shopping at the neighborhood grocery store. And they said it was so unbelievable to see the division of attire at this at this wedding. Half of, uh, probably more than half of the wedding, the people knew how they should be dressed and were dressed appropriately. But the other half were simply shocking. There's no doubt about it. And that is my pet grievance with our city. Now, for instance, I think you will agree, Lorraine, that probably the Pops concert every May is one of our most important social events. Uh, in my book, it certainly is. Have you been to the Pops concert lately and seen how the people dress? No, I haven't. I remember I covered the Pops concert with pictures and writing for years and years on end. I think it's been in existence about 26 years. And every man, every single man used to be in a tuxedo. And every woman dressed in her best in the air of long dresses. Everybody in a long dress. Now I go to the Pops concerts as an objective attendant, attender. And it is incredible. You don't see a tuxedo. You don't see a cocktail-type dress. You don't, you don't, hardly ever, maybe a small percentage of the group. It's turned into a you pay your money and take your choice, sort of informal, drip-dry uh, sort of audience. I think it's just so sad. Do you think you could date this change? So much happened in the 60s and early 70s, or do you think it was coming before that? I think that we had a sense of taste and appropriateness up to World War II. I think lots of things changed after World War II. Um, one of the things, Lorraine, that changed so drastically after World War II that I remember vividly was the introduction of the buffet supper as a type 
of entertainment. That definitely was tied up with World War II and the lack of help. Mm -hmm. People couldn't get help, and so the easiest way for the hostess was to put an array of food out on a sideboard or a table and let people serve themselves. Um, they, they, I always call it the sit on the stairs era <laughs> because whoever heard of guests sitting on the floor and on the stairs at parties before you were seated either with trays or at a table, but there was a degree of formality. With the coming of the buffet, it was grab your plate, uh, put, pile it high with food, and go sit on the stairway or go sit on the floor. And um, I think that it made people think that that was proper, that it was okay. And of course, in my opinion, it was of necessity, but not necessarily very proper. Mm -hmm. And um, now I am seeing a return to um, the small dinner party where a, a, a card table or two uh, are set up in the living room and then the, the, uh, the dining room table and whatnot. We're returning more to small dinner parties mm -hmm with a guest list, oh, let's say, of 12 to 16, that sort of thing. They're delightful events, and I think most people just love them. Uh, of course, we will always have the payback huge cocktail parties. That's Madison's idea of saying thank you for, for your entertainment and whatnot is the huge cocktail party. Some people just loathe them and other people like myself who love to see my friends like them because it's a way of seeing your friends. That reminds me, it seems to me that the term cocktail party came in after World War II. I would, I, that is in the newspapers. Can you date that by any chance? Uh, I think you're a little bit wrong, Lorraine. Uh, as I say, I'm 76 years old and my my memory is that um, cocktail parties go back a long, long way. I'll tell you what has come in recent years, as opposed to the cocktail parties of earlier years, is this business of making the cocktail buffet, magic oh. word, the cocktail buffet, mm -hmm. is now all the rage with the inevitable turkey, ham, smoked <laughs> salmon, uh, meatballs, shrimp. Um, in other words, it's a regular meal. Mm -hmm. uh, I can truthfully tell you that um, when I go to a modern, meaning post-World War II mm -hmm. cocktail party, I always make them my dinner. Now, in the, in the early ones of my youth, um, they were strictly cocktails and hors d'oeuvres, mm -hmm. uh, a great difference. But it's turned into the cocktail buffet, and that makes sense because it is a meal for virtually everyone who goes. I, you will probably remember how when you went to a cocktail party 40 years ago, uh, that uh, the stock remark was, well, let's go out to so-and-so and have a steak dinner, or let's... Afterwards. Yes, afterwards, let's go out and have a meal. I don't ever hear that anymore. I absolutely never hear anyone say, oh, let's go out to the Cuba Club. Let's go out to this, that, or the other place and have a dinner. Because the cocktail buffet has become a real meal and a very good one. Um, we've mentioned changes in dress, including weddings and concerts, and what, let's focus a little bit, uh, since you were a society editor, on changes in the society page. Oh, the change, well, don't get me started, Lorraine. I could, I could just weep buckets because um, I gave my life, you know, I was society editor for 41 years, and the hours that I put in on that job are were just horrendous. Nobody can believe the amount of work, that the hours that went into it. 
And if, if I'm sure you being a native of Madison remember my beautiful front pages and the pictures, the pictures and yes. the feature articles mm -hmm. and whatnot that were my pride and joy and uh, took an awful lot of effort too. Yes. It was hard work. I wish I had a dollar, Lorraine, for every person, male and female, in Dane County who tells me how they miss the old society section. Well, I think you knew everybody in Dane County. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew an awful lot because we gave coverage to brides from all over southern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, in June and August of each year, now I believe this is quite accurate, I used to have as many as 80 columns of, oh my word. of society on those Sundays when we had just dozens upon dozens upon dozens of weddings, not only from Madison, but all the little towns around. Mm -hmm. uh, we never turned any bride down. We always gave space to every girl who wanted her wedding or engagement in. And in the, my bosses in that particular era were very pro-society section-minded. They believed that it was important and that they believed that uh, the readership was tremendous. And um, this era that came in uh, about the time I retired, just about the time I retired, which was September 14, 1974. Um, of the little dinky pictures of the man and woman together, about the size of two postage stamps, and then every single item identically the same. Miss L L Lorraine Hubbard and Kenneth Orchard were married Saturday in the First Congregational Church. First church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They are, their parents are, and they mm -hmm. will live at, and so forth. To me, it is the dullest, dreariest, most boring way of telling the most important things in the lives of our citizens. Somebody said, well, somebody said to me once, well, Louise, what you have got to realize is that Madison is now a very large city and people don't know each other anymore and uh, they're not interested in Joe Blow marrying Mary Smith and I say to them, Poobah, uh, Madison is not that large a city mm -hmm. and when you multiply all of the friends and relatives mm -hmm. of the people involved in a wedding mm -hmm. every weekend after weekend after weekend, you have a great number of people who are interested and it's a multiple thing it's a mushrooming thing and I think that of course I'm terribly prejudiced Lorraine and I will just tell you so flat footedly in that I think that the decision of these little inky dinky wedding stories and engagement stories the men were responsible for the decisions mm. throughout the United States on the society pages. You know it just isn't Madison. The Milwaukee Journal, do you remember how yes. marvelous it is? Look at it now. It's just pathetic. And the same is true nationwide. And I'm sorry to have to say it because I like men, but I think the decisions were made by men and that they flubbed it. I would like to uh, to see um, Madison newspapers go back to giving details of weddings the way we used to, but I doubt very seriously that it will ever come about because, of course, the descriptions were space eaters, and, you know, it's now everything is the bottom line. I'm convinced mm -hmm. that everything in America is now the bottom line. And this, this applies to newspapers and advertising and all that sort of thing. But, oh, I'm so glad that I had the good years as society editor. And do you remember, Lorraine, the number of feature articles that we, our staff used to write? 
John Newhouse, Helen oh, Matheson, yeah, and myself, and Elizabeth Mason Gould, and, and all of us wrote, Don Davies, we wrote feature articles upon feature articles about local people, and they had tremendous readership. Of course they did. And perhaps uh, you will recall my daily column from the notebook. I did. I well, do. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, of course, naturally, this sounds like this sounds like bragging, and I don't want it to really. But I was very proud of it because the Northwestern University School of Journalism conducted a poll at the request of my publisher Don Anderson on which features in the Wisconsin State Journal were the most read day after day. And I will tell you unashamedly that my column from the notebook ran second only to Ann Landers. How marvelous. And uh, you were, uh, I want to discuss that column a little bit with you because in all the years that it ran, it ran five days a week, not on Saturday, but uh, or six days a week, I guess, because I had it on Sunday, too. Um, I only had two or three complaints from readers over all the many years oh, that I wrote Lord. it. And that was because I double-checked every single item with the people. I checked and rechecked. If you will recall, that um, column was anecdotal. Yes. It, it had little stories about many Madison people. Prominent, not so prominent, mm -hmm. and very unprominent. Mm -hmm. But the uh, success of that column was its accuracy and the fact that it did not cater to one segment of the Madison population. That column could never, on its best day, have ever been branded just Maple Bluff, Sherwood Hills, Nakoma, uh, Parkwood Hills, or something like that. Any good story that came in from anybody, or if I heard of any amusing anecdote, no matter how humble the people, how simple the background, uh, I checked it with them and used it. And because of that, it had total readership. People knew that they would see their friends in it mm -hmm. from every level, every strata of life in Madison, from the highest to the lowest. And, uh, it just depended on whether the story was sufficiently amusing or interesting. Of course, combined with it was a lot of routine society. Who was on a trip? Who was giving a party? Who uh, was... I'd, I used to write a lot of columns that had tremendous readership, as you will recall, over how people dressed for certain occasions. I would say uh, at the Pops concert, I would write a long column on who looked glamorous and who looked stunning and, and clothes, and people ate that kind of thing up. It was names, 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 names people they knew or knew of and they were the readership was unbelievable now my heartbreak after all those 41 years of hard work is that to me there seems to be so little personal business in the society pages it is just the most stark routine marriage or engagement announcement or wedding anniversary I just don't get it at all. I think it's too bad that the personal touch has vanished from the society pages. Do you think the uh, personal touch has vanished too when you go into a department store or ride a bus or do something in Madison? Now Manchester's of course was right down here from yeah. your apartment, a few blocks. And um, do you think that we have lost some of that, or do you think that the stores are continuing that? No, I think we've lost a great, great deal in personal uh, treatment in the service industry, and especially in stores. 
Now, um, I'm of the generation, you know, of where you went into the grocery store and in your family and neighborhood, I grew up in Appleton, and the grocer with a great big long hook thing would reach up to get the box of cereal and then he'd dash and get the oranges and dash and get the flour and sugar and butter and whatnot. You, you could remain at the counter and just say what you wanted. And the grocer ran around like a wild man getting all the things. But it was an era I loved, and I'll bet you do too, I of where it. we were waited on and taken care of. I go into a modern drugstore. I happen to have some illnesses which require quite a good deal of medication. So I'm a frequent customer in, in drugstores. I don't know about you, but I go simply wild, hunting for the toothpaste, hunting for the aspirin, where is the face powder? Uh, it's unbelievable to me. I don't have any idea of where the articles are in one of these great big drugstores. Uh, and I'm sure that my feeling of being lost and bewildered is common to an awful lot of customers. Candy is mixed right in with the toothpaste <laughs> and whatnot. I just can't get over it. I like service. Um, I think, too, while we're talking, we've covered somewhat the downtown square, but not very much. But uh, the talking about changes. It seems to me the Capitol Square personifies it. Uh, can you recall some of the favorite places you would you worked right there, oh, of course, yes. oh, that yes. you would like to visit oh, or walk by? Yes. I'm, I am, of course, uh, since I have lived at One Langdon all of my residency in Madison, um, I am and haven't driven a car since 1934. I am obviously a Capitol Square person, and I just, my heart just bleeds for the changes when you think about Simpson store, Barron's, Manchester's, Olson and Verhusen, the Crescent men's store, Wolf Kubli and Hersing. I can just go on and on and on. The old Western Union office. Cops Cafe. Uh, it, it's just it's just such a change that it breaks my heart. Uh, Lorraine, when in the days of the Depression, you must remember, I came here on my job on January 9th, 1934, for twelve fifty a week. That was my salary, twelve fifty a week or fifty dollars a month. Every single lunch, I went around the corner to Cops Cafe which you probably are too young to remember. No, I remember Cap's <laughs> Cafe. Old J.I. Coppernow oh, yes. on the square. Right. I would have wonderful cream of tomato soup, homemade vegetable soup. Um, Cops always had a wonderful, wonderful homemade type soup. And a grilled cheese sandwich for 20 cents day after day when I was working. And people, all young people always say to me, how did you manage to live on twelve fifty a week? Well, I said, I always say to them, it's just a matter of, of degree. I ate my lunch for 20 cents, whereas you eat yours for two dollars or two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, I had my hair done uh, every week for 75 cents, shampooed and waved, 75 cents. Whereas now I plunk down a $10 bill mm -hmm. and, and leave it at the end of the beauty treatment and so forth. It's all a matter of degree. And frankly, we lived quite well on modest salaries. I, when I was in school, I worked at Barron's department store on Saturdays. And I was paid $2 for the whole Saturday, eight hours two cents off for Social Security. What was the bus fare then? Five or about, ten cents? I think about five cents. Five cents. Yeah. So then let's say a total yeah. of ten. Then I went over to the Hofbrau yes. and had a 35-cent lunch. Yes. Of course, I didn't go home with much left. No. But 
talk about relative. I yes. did all that with yes. and yes. had a little money left over. I think that that is very true. Now, I told you I started at 12.50 a week in January of 1934. Within three months, I was raised to 15 a week. And at the end of a year, 20 a week, and I thought I was as rich as Croesus. I thought I could do anything. Right. Uh, I, w I had so much money to spend on 20 a week that it was unbelievable. When I tell that to today's young people, they look at me in blind. Louise, um, let's return to the, your days on the University of Wisconsin campus, since that was such an important part of your life and since you live in a spot where you can see so much yes. that goes on. Yes. Um, well, first of all, uh, I think that we students, now you must remember that it was Prohibition, Lorraine. And that is a very important thing to bring up because in my era, outwardly and openly, there was absolutely minimal drinking of any kind, including 3% beer. Um, it, it was a, an entirely different era. Weekend after weekend after weekend, hundreds and hundreds of students went out Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights and danced their feet off at Chanticleer, Hollywood at the Beach, and Esther Beach. It was a wonderful gathering. It was like a giant-sized club. You knew everybody. You chatted with everyone. You drank lemonade at 10 cents a glass and drank one lemonade for a whole evening as entertainment. And in addition, your beau bought a dollar or a dollar and a half's worth of tickets at 10 cents a dance. The orchestras played long, long sets. And so a dollar's worth of tickets would last a couple hours because the, the dance sets were so long. I happen to like dancing better than anything oh, else I in life, it, practically. Too. And uh, the, the happiest memories of my life as a co-ed were those weekends at those three dance halls where you saw all your friends. Now, how did we dress for those things? Believe me, my dear, we were not in slacks or uh, some chintzy little uh, drip-dry dress or something. We dressed up. A date was important, and you dressed accordingly. Now, do you remember when you would go to the Orpheum or Capitol Theaters to a movie, and you definitely dressed up? You wore high heels, and you wore white gloves and you wore a, a tailored dress or a, a, what we called date dresses. Do you remember we had what we called were date dresses? That's true. And But we dressed up and we made an occasion of it. And I think it was not only feminine and made us attractive as women, but I think it was very flattering to our dates, the fact that we made an occasion out of going to what, what were the movies? About 50 cents? Or, or less, I yeah. think. Uh, a piece. And, Quarters. Yeah, and boys didn't have any money, you know, during mm -hmm. the Depression. Nobody had any money at all. So going to a movie followed by a hot fudge sundae at the chocolate shop on State If you Street, could afford it. <laughs> if you could afford it. <laughs> was, was a big, big night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was a... Of course, I'm sure that every student of every generation thinks that his or her era was marvelous. But I will always be so grateful that I was young when I was young. And I am especially grateful that I went to the university at a time of when the entertainment was on campus. On campus. A magic phrase. We didn't feel, my dear, in our sorority or fraternity parties that we had to go to Lake Geneva or to Milwaukee or to some 
resort 150 miles away in chartered buses. It was on campus because people had no money and the only way they could have a party was patronizing their own sorority or fraternity house or dormitory and, and paying a little money in and having it on the spot. And this is something that apparently has gone out of style on the campus. I happen to be a member of Gamma Phi Beta and a very loyal and a very active alum. And I'm always amazed when I hear the girls saying, oh, we're going to go to the Abbey mm -hmm. at Lake Geneva for our spring formal. And I think, what in heaven's name are they going to the Abbey for when they have a perfectly beautiful house with ample room for dancing? I can remember when the local orchestras all went around to the sorority and fraternity houses and played for all of those Christmas formals and spring mm -hmm. formals, and you do too. The rugs were taken up, a little wax, a uh, little polished stuff put on the floor, and the party was there. And elegant food served for peanuts. A marvelous dinner for absolute minimal cost. What are these youngsters paying when they go off campus? For all their for all their major entertainment at Christmas and spring, I don't get it at all. I think it's a shame. I wondered how that started. I I wonder too if soon that won't end because I can't see that they have a rollicking time. I I don't know why it got started. I don't know why it did either, but I'm awfully afraid that it came with a certain amount of affluence a certain amount of post-World War II affluence of where it was glam money came easily and uh, it was quite glamorous to go in a, in a chartered bus, 50 strong, a couple of buses, and go 150 miles. I heard uh, last spring about some people who went to Milwaukee for their spring formal. Do you regard it as glamorous? To no. go to Milwaukee, of all places, for your spring formal? I think Madison has much more to offer in beauty, scenic beauty, and everything than, than a big metropolitan city like Milwaukee. I don't understand this trend at all. And um, I have an opportunity living here at 1 Langdon Street to look around in this area. And in my own block, the first block on Langdon Street, are several sorority fraternity houses. Mm -hmm. And in the next block, there are even more. So I see a lot. Why, do you remember, Lorraine, how important it was to have a pretty dress for the spring formal? Mm -hmm. I plotted and, and pleaded and begged my father to buy me a... a, a remember when Mrs. Tiffany's was oh, all the yes. rage on oh, State Street? Right. And I wanted a specific white embroidered organza dress for my sorority spring formal for my senior year. I had seen a picture of it in Vulgar Harper's Bazaar or something and wanted Mrs. Tiffany to copy it, and she did. And my father was so thrilled that I wanted to have such a beautiful dress and that I was willing to wear it for not one, but many years. Yes. And that's another thing. We didn't always feel in those depression years that we had to have a new dress every single time. Uh, you know, of course, this has always amused me so much I can hardly stand it. During the depression years, and this will come as an absolute shock to today's young people, every smart co-ed had a boy in every fraternity and every fraternity <laughs> boy had a girl in every sorority because <laughs> he wanted to get to the parties without costing him a lot <laughs> and the girls wanted to have a good time mm -hmm. and knew that the boys didn't have any money. I think one of the phenomenon that, that I saw and of course I'm older than you are but that I saw was that during the depression years going steadily 
was absolutely O-U-T. With the vast majority of students, they couldn't afford it. So, uh, so that, you know, young people are always operators. They're always maneuvering. <laughs> you made a point of cultivating friends in many different places so that you would have a good social life and not be a drain on any one boy. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why, I can just tell you, I deliberately, my first year on the campus, 1930 and 31, saw to it that I had about five or six gentlemen in various fraternities and places that uh, liked me enough to invite me because uh, nobody had enough money to take you to everything. Mm -hmm. Nobody did. When I went to prom in my junior year at the university, I was the only girl in the Gamma Phi house who had an orchid corsage. Nobody but nobody had even seen an orchid corsage for a long, long time. And I happened to be dating at that time uh, a Madison young man who had quite, whose family had quite a good deal of money and he did things in a very elegant way. But I can remember that, that I was the only girl in my sorority who had an orchid corsage. Now they're a dime a dozen, you know, just a dime a dozen. Mm -hmm. Everybody but everybody takes an orchid corsage for granted. Things that, the, the, um, the degree of affluence has ch changed so much over the years. I don't think that uh, today's young people, only those of us who went through the Great Depression, can remember how stringent things were. For instance, uh, I remember definitely walking to every place like the Memorial Union or to fraternity houses because boys didn't have cars. Mm -hmm. Nobody had a car except those with a physical handicap. At the Gamma Phi house, one of my sorority sisters, Ann Palmer of Janesville, had heart trouble and she was allowed to have a car on the campus and it was the only car for our group and that's the way it was in house after house after house. You had to have a definite physical handicap where a doctor said that you needed to ride in order to have a car on campus. We walked. I walked, you know, way out on the campus for certain classes. Uh, we never thought a thing about walking a long distance and there were no campus buses. No campus buses, no campus parking lots, no campus anything. If you went to the home ec building from Langdon Street, you had a big, long hike, Lorraine. That was a long hike. And, and you know that we did it nonchalantly. We never expected to have a ride. And uh, now I understand that you can hardly find a parking place. There's so many cars on the campus, so they tell me. Do you think there's been a change in attitude towards sports? Um, of course, right now I'm thinking of women from our day. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's, there are much more, uh, many more opportunities for women in sports now than there were in our day. We, we, were, we were a neglected sex sport-wise. Heavenly day. Who ever heard of of a woman's volleyball team or a woman's basketball team or a women's anything. We were just very definitely a subsidiary to the macho men who had dominated all the sports. All the sports. I think of that too. Isn't there even a women's crew now that's doing well? Oh, I guess there is definitely and I think they're doing very well and that it's a big thing to be on the women's crew. Oh, oh, there's so many. There's no doubt about it that Women's Lib has elevated the status of women on the campus so much more. Uh, we were very much more uh, typical uh, female-male relationship. Uh, we, were, we were wondering all the time, would we have a date on Saturday night? Would we have a date on Friday night? would we be invited to the prom? I can remember 
that for weeks before prom, everybody was a nervous wreck. Would they be invited? I don't think the formal social structures now have any importance at all to most of the most of the students they're much more and of course i think it's terrible you know i've never had a drop of liquor in my life i never have drunk at all and uh, as i always say i'm the last person swept out of every party that's another talk in itself because <laughs> the idea that you have to drink to be popular is the most insane thing i've ever known it's just absolutely absurd and when i see these little 17 year old freshman boys and girls come here 18 years old and think that they've got to guzzle beer night after night and certainly every weekend just turns my stomach because they don't have to do it if they don't want to it, it's nobody cares Lorraine what you do as long as you don't tell them what to do it's when you preach and tell the others and I've told that to more young girls when they have come to the university as personal friends you don't have to do anything you don't want to as long as you don't preach and tell the others what they have to do if you're going to be sanctimonious and pious and self-righteous or you're going to be very unpopular but if you have a laissez-faire uh, attitude you can you can be as well behaved and conservative as you want to be and you'll have friends I think that's so true um, I wish more people would get that message and have that self-confidence too yes uh, uh, you see I think that um, uh, so much of this beer drinking and this carousing at football games and the rowdyism and uh, what not is caused by a lack of self-adequacy, self-assurance. They think they've got to do something body in order to be popular, and it's so pitiful. It's not only pitiful, but it's ludicrous. They don't have to right. at all. I just wish that we could get back to the subject of adults dressing in Madison. Uh, I, I just think that it is so terrible that women no longer feel a need for what you and I would call dressy clothes in their wardrobes. I heard about a beautiful, stunning, wonderful style show put on this summer by one of Madison's leading women's stores. Uh, nearly 500 women attended and it was a terrific event but one of my close friends said to me that all around her now my friend happens to be a woman who dresses very well and in elegant taste but she said she was horrified to hear the conversations around her are like this oh these clothes are so stunning but where would I ever wear them in Madison she said that was a comment made over and over and over. Where would I ever wear a beautiful dress like that? Now, don't you think that is pretty sad? Yes, it is. Uh, over how Madison has slipped. Mm -hmm. As I told you, in the beginning of this talk, I just feel that Madison has lost so much of its class. So much of its mm -hmm. class, especially in adult attire. I think we expect the students to look like bums a lot of the time. Uh, I've abandoned hope for them. <laughs> they, they're going to be casual and informal forever, I'm sure of that. But there's no excuse for middle-aged and above men and women looking seedy. And I think a lot of your friends and my friends look very tacky at, a, at lovely parties and events in this city. You go to the Memorial Union, to the concert series, to the, to the uh, lecture series. What do you see? Does it shock you as much as it does me? They are dressed in the most informal, incredibly uh, <coughs> informal attire that I can imagine. I, can't you remember when going to the theater was an event? Yes. And you dressed up for it? 
When did pants suits come oh, in? Oh Lord, when fifties, sixties? I can't quite date them. Either. I think I I don't know. I've never owned any in my entire life. So you're asking the wrong person. I have never because I'm I'm a large woman. I have never worn slacks or shorts. I've never ever in my life owned either one. So it's hard for me to say. But I would think that they became very much accepted, socially accepted, uh, in the 60s and 70s. I rather think that's yes. it, too. Can you remember when um, the former Mrs. Warren Knowles, the ex-wife yes. of our governor, just caused a sensation, <laughs> absolutely a mm -hmm. sensation, by going to Warren's inauguration in a yellow pantsuit. Yes. Uh, now that goes to show you, Lorraine, how things were accepted. That, 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 that they were just accepted. That you could go anywhere in a nice pantsuit or whatnot. I still think that pantsuits, according to my friends, are extremely comfortable and appropriate for many circumstances. And I would be the last person in the world to, to peer down my nose and say, oh, I think pantsuits are terrible because pantsuits are not terrible at all when they're worn when for they're the right perfect. occasion. Mm -hmm. But I think that when we go to a lady's luncheon or to a wedding, which certainly calls for dignity, and if we go to uh, uh, other, let's say, committee meetings for a major event, I cannot see this business, business of donning a, a blouse and a pair of slacks and, and going off to a ladies' luncheon. I, I just uh, I, I just don't understand it. That makes me think of church dress. Oh, mercy above. Now we are on something. <laughs> I can remember in Madison, I'm a Congregationalist myself, and uh, I can remember when we would not even think of entry the church doors without a hat. And my Catholic friends would have thought that the Lord would have struck them right down on the spot if they had gone to Mass without a hat on. Now, I have gone to Protestant and Catholic events in recent years where I have seen shorts, shorts, mind you, in church, where I have seen the most immodest type of blouses, not a hat in sight. You could shoot a cannon off and not hit a not hit a hat. And to me, well, it's just almost obscene, just obscene. The lack of uh, being covered up. Heavenly days, isn't it tremendous on a on a summer Sunday? What you see in the way of acres of flesh. I think I think it's very shocking myself. Um, I wonder, and I don't think we want to get into this, but so much of the ritual is being changed in so many churches too yes. that I think some of the tone is so different. Yeah. And I don't know which came first, the dress or the ritual, or they're they're related. I, yes. Oh, I, I have think, an idea. I think so too. I have um, several. Uh, Oh, a number of good friends who are Catholic, and they're in my age group, and they are heartsick over what they see in attire at their churches. Uh, first of all, this is the group that has never recovered from the Mass not being said in Latin. They're still in that era where that's the only way to hear a Mass. They're not at all happy with the Mass in English, and they are desperately unhappy over the way people go to church in what they consider, in what I consider, most immodest attire. And I see it in my own church, too. This isn't a, a Catholic Protestant thing. This is it's, it's universal. It's universal. Mm -hmm. I wish you'd tell me whoever was responsible for creating this uh, impression and idea that informality was de rigueur, that it's the thing to be. I think it is the most 
the saddest thing, fashion-wise, that has happened in America. And as I say, I understand it isn't just Madison. I understand it's nationwide. But I just cannot get over the fact that women, no matter what their physical shape may be, feel that they can go out in public in, well, the most informal revealing clothes in the world. By that I mean uh, old little blouses tied with a knot mm -hmm. uh, and midriffs absolutely bare, thighs absolutely bare. We see it everywhere. Short shorts and as I always refer to it as acres of flesh <laughs> and not very appealing flesh. I must tell you one of my favorite remarks and I've quoted it hundreds and hundreds of times over the years and I still think it's so true I was at a dinner party oh probably 40 years ago when Dr. Hart E. Van Riper a very prominent and popular Madison pediatrician was among the guests and the, this subject came up of women's attire and Hart Van Riper in his very dry way said I'll never forget it well, the first thing, people, that you must all realize is that no woman's thighs are ever attractive after the age of 18 months. Oh. <laughs> and I think it's one of the truest things mm -hmm. that I've ever heard. I've, I've quoted it so many times with this attire that we see everywhere. You, you were in a position when you were the society editor, and now you are still exceedingly active, to observe Madison clubs, country clubs, yes. civics club, old alumni clubs, clubs, period. Clubs, period. Yes. Have you noticed changes over oh, the years? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Lorraine, uh, there's no doubt about it. We have been uh, eyewitnesses to a tremendous phenomenon. Uh, in the world of clubs. Um, you will remember that when you were young, your mother probably belonged to two or three organized clubs, uh, perhaps uh, a Masonic group or two, highly organized and structured, and uh, this was par for the course. The, the woman's club, the Catholic woman's club, but, uh, the um, Jewish Hadassah, AAUW, I can go on and on and on. They were very important to virtually every woman. She belonged to something. Now I understand, and it cer certainly is apparent in some of the clubs, that the young women of today are not interested at all in so-called structured clubs. The, the, I think we, you, we have seen, uh, you will perhaps recall the tremendous prominence and strength of the Madison Women's Club in decades past. You never hear of it now. It is, it is just a thing of the past. And I think it's a shame. When I first came to Madison in 1934, the Women's Club, Madison Women's Club, had a membership of hundreds and hundreds of women. It had sub-meetings, it had group meetings, interest meetings, general meetings, luncheons. It was a great, important social factor in the life of Madison. It has absolutely vanished from the scene. Young people weren't interested and it died more or less of attrition. And I think it's heartbreaking. And they tell me that young women, now we've got to face up to the fact, Lorraine, that so many young women are working. I think that does center in. So many young women are working and that has eliminated the formal, a lot of the formal club so. life. But um, uh, there still is not interest from what you and I call the housewife the young wife and mother who stays home who isn't working. And there still are a lot of those. There are a lot of those women who are devoting full time to being wives and mothers. And that's, that's marvelous. They don't want to belong to anything like that. 
oh, they're not interested at all. The Madison Civics Club is sort of in a class by itself, isn't it? Yes. When you think that they have a waiting list a mile long, year after year. Year after year. Year, and it's been going since the memory of man, and that, with its, what is it, five or six lectures a year. Five, I think. Five luncheons and lectures a year. Still, is just tremendously popular. But can you tell me any other women's group that has that popularity? I don't know uh, much about modern groups because when I was society editor, my bosses, the first week I came to work, said, Louise, you are going to be a newspaper reporter and must be objective. We don't want you to belong to anything. I see. We do not want you to have membership in any group or organization. We don't want you beholden to them. We don't want you to have a natural prejudice in giving them space. Just be completely an outsider as far as organized organizations are concerned. And so I followed that. Well, when you retire at age 65, uh, you have lost out on an awful lot of, of structural things. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, all of my friends in my peer group, virtually all of them, are members of bridge foursomes and long established bridge foursomes. I worked till the day I was 65. I retired on my 65th birthday. I never was able to play bridge ever during, during my long uh, professional career. Are you playing now? I'm playing a little, and I like it. I enjoy it a lot, and I'm a reasonably good player. But I'm not a regular in any group. Uh, I missed out because I wasn't available years ago. Even if they'd wanted me, I wasn't available. And now I'm 76, and I'm not, I'm not pressed into service for, for substituting much. I do occasionally, and I'm invited occasionally to bridge lunches but not like my friends are who meet. I have one friend that I'm very fond of who's quite a bit older than I am who plays bridge on a regular basis with definite foursomes like three times a week. Let's say Monday, Wednesday, and Friday ever of every week she plays with certain foursomes. Well, I have none of that in my life because I was a career woman. Absolutely. I happen to like bridge. And I'm I making a note, and I <laughs> see that you're going to play some. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in fact, I have to watch now that I've retired that I don't play too much. Yes, there's a tendency, especially Lorraine, as women grow older. Uh, my mother, who lived to be 87, was crippled with arthritis, terribly handicapped with arthritis, and bridge was her lifesaver. One, it kept her mind occupied and off the pain. And two, it involved a minimum of physical effort. That's true. And she greatly preferred a foursome to any other because there wasn't much moving about and mm -hmm. uh, much fruit basket upset, you know, that sort of thing. That's right. uh, for older people, especially those with physical handicap, handicaps, uh, 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 bridge is just a lifesaver. It is. Um, while you were talking about clubs, I thought of country clubs. Yes. They seem to keep going, oh, don't yes. you think? Thrive, as yes. far as I know. Yes. Oh, I think the country clubs, all of them in Madison, are very important to their members and are thriving. I think many of them have waiting lists. And uh, the men love the golf, and some of the, many of the women do too. But for the women, there's an awful lot of... Uh, allied social activity with a country club that they adore. Style shows, luncheons, bridge sessions, um, benefits, all sorts of things. They love the social life. The country clubs are now, I believe, the source of much of Madison's social life. Much of it, I think. And, uh, I, you know, I have many friends uh, I belong to the Madison Club myself and thoroughly enjoy it uh, so much for the privilege of having good meals. It's a dining club for both men and women, and I love the privilege of entertaining 
uh, at a club where there's excellent food and a very pleasant atmosphere. When you go into the country club thing, then you get into the golf enthusiasts and the things like that because golf is such an important part of life to men and women in Madison because of the short season. We have such a short golfing season and it's vitally important to them. Well, Louise, this has been just wonderful. Now, you have a trademark in Madison, whether you know it or not, and it is related to what you've been saying, and that's hats. Would you care to comment on hats for women or men, too, if that interests you? Would I ever like to? I should say so. Well, first of all, I want to tell you just a wee bit about my personal history. Uh, my mother was a very physically beautiful woman with snow white hair and green eyes and she had her white hair from the time that she was 35 years old and she was one of those smart, smart women who capitalized on a rather freak of nature thing and with her snow paper white hair from the time that she was a young woman one of her devices of if you want to call it playing up to a feature, was that she had perfectly gorgeous hats. Mm -hmm. Her hats were conversation pieces from the time she was in her 30s and she died at 87. And Frances Marston was just known in Appleton, along with two or three other women, for her beautiful, beautiful chapeaus. Well, having a, mother, a, a youthful mother in her 30s, who loved hats better than life itself, I was thoroughly indoctrinated from the time I was a toddler that no well-dressed woman ever, ever went out during the daytime without a hat. And so that it was the most natural, unpretentious, completely normal thing for me always to love hats. And... Um, uh, I will tell you this, very frankly, that um, I think one of the fashion tragedies of our lifetime was the uh, abolishing of hats on a on a day-to-day -day wearing by the vast majority of women. And do you know when it all came about, Lorraine? I can peg it exactly. It came with the beehive-haired, Jacqueline those, Kennedy, those <laughs> dreadful beehive. Uh, hairdresses mm -hmm. where the hair was piled up on top of the head and a hat would have been ludicrous perching on mm -hmm. top of it. Uh, th that was the demise of hats. I never wore my hair that way. I always despised the hairdress and went my wear merry way wearing my hair uh, in a way that I could wear hats. But I think now this hat business has had a certain sinister quality to it that bothers me terribly. And that is that educated, well-groomed, attractive women now feel self-conscious if they wear a hat. In other words, instead of becoming routine, they are self-conscious. Now, to me, this denotes, oh, such a lack of poise and self-assurance that they care that somebody else would say, oh mercy, look at she's wearing a hat. Uh, I don't know about you, but that sort of thing is alarming to me when somebody cares that much which, what other people say. Uh, I want to tell you an experience that I had with a very dear friend of mine in Madison, a sweet, pretty, popular woman, the wife of a professional man, who gets about a great deal socially, uh, who I uh, think is just a darling person, and imagine this conversation. I was wearing a new hat at a party, and frankly, I just was crazy about the hat, and it was causing a great deal of favorable comment at a luncheon. And this dear little friend of mine leaned over and said, oh, Louise, 
I would I just love your hats and I would give anything to wear them again but I'm so frightened of oh. wearing them oh. can you imagine a well educated nice lady saying that she was frightened of wearing a hat I thought it was the most revealing remark mm -hmm. that anybody could make about what has happened in our time that Lorraine I go place after place after place where there are only two or three women with hats in the whole group and I wear mine proudly happily and with complete self-assurance I don't give a continental if there isn't another woman in the room who hasn't got a hat on because I feel that I am properly dressed and they can do as they wish but I for my inner satisfaction have to wear one I've noticed in stores there are more hats oh, yes. now and they oh, do yes. make an outfit look complete oh, yes. so I think the trend maybe is reversing oh, yes. But what we said earlier about self-esteem surely enters into this. Yes. And poise. Yes. And, and the terrible thing to me, because if you know me very well and you know that I am completely free of this as an individual, is of caring so much what somebody will say or what they may think. To me, uh, you know, I've, I've never married and I've been a rugged individualist all my life. I cannot comprehend that there are people whose lives are so influenced by what other people will say. Good for you. I love ending on that note. That is so true.